go. Cool. So welcome, everybody. Um, I am going to go through a formal introduction, and I also want to hear and introduce yourself so we at least get to know each other because food is a community activity. But before we do that, for the people who are cooking along with me, I want to make sure we get the squash in the oven, and I just wanted to show you how to cut down a butternut squash because I know sometimes it can seem a bit like a beast. And then you can apply this technique to any other winter squashes. So we'll start here and then we'll reverse a little bit and do formal introductions if that's cool with everybody. Um, so you guys can see my squash and cutting board. So I'm just gonna cut off one of the ends and then the other end. And then I'm gonna cut it at the base of the neck. So now I've got two pieces that sit flat. So that's gonna make things way easier, in my opinion, than for peeling, because you've got a stable base for the squash. So let's start with the part that doesn't have the seeds. Then you can just go through that little seam between the flesh and the skin and start peeling. Hi, Sandy, welcome. Hey, um, I couldn't get in on my iPad. Sorry for the delay. No, that's okay. No problem. Um, okay, I was going to try to go to um, the other view, but it's not letting me. San are you cooking with us, Sandy? I am. And um, I've got most everything already done, but I'm working on the squash. Okay. Great. So, yeah, we just have the top separated from the bottom so that they're sitting flat, and then we're just going to peel. And then we're just going to do a really rough chop. Okay. I find that this is the easiest way to peel squashes. It's you essentially want a flat piece on your cutting board so that it's stable. Ah, okay. And we're going to split the bottom piece down the middle. And that way we can get rid of the seeds. And for this recipe, we don't have to be that particular about perfect sizes, because we're ultimately going to puree everything. We're just getting a head start in the oven with getting it soft. So we're not going to be too uptight about perfect uniform pieces. Okay. I apologize for I'm making a mess with these things. That's okay. They're going everywhere. All right, so then at this point, you've got a really manageable squash. So we're gonna do this in probably like one and a half inch chunks. Just cut through. And I'm gonna throw that on the baking sheet that I lined with some parchment paper. So it'll look like this, similar at home. And so you'll see, I have some pretty just rough chopped chunks. And then we'll do the same thing, about one and a half inch piece, pieces on the bottom part. Can I ask a question? Are you leaving the seeds in? I can't tell on the phone. No, we took the seeds out. So I okay. just put them into the compost. Yeah, okay. so they're out. The majority of that, like, stringy business. It's not a big deal if it's in there. It just sort of folds onto the seeds. Mm -hmm. Stringy business is an official term. And can you bring the um, yeah. Tray? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now we've just got our squash. This is, I think, about a two-pound squash from the recipe. I'm just going to give it a good drizzle of olive oil. Antonella, I have a question. The reason that they don't have to be fussy about how they're mm -hmm. cutting it is because it's going to be pureed? Yeah, it's going to be pureed. And we're also going to cook it twice. So it's going to cook in the oven and then it's going to simmer in the soup. So we're going to have a lot of time to cook it down. Um, so if it gets a little bit too mushy, not an issue. And if it's a little bit on the big side, it'll get soft in the soup and then we'll puree it. Yeah, so it's all going to look uniform at the end. And then Herschel, yeah. you had a question? Oh, you have to unmute. I'm just going to lightly salt these as we get our first question in. 
So um, right. I bought a two pound squash. The squash was two pounds. Mm -hmm. okay? I mean, that's with the, everything. So once I cut it up. Yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I often have this question, but I always go off like if it says two pounds, that's what I buy at the grocery store. And then I know it's getting trimmed. And plus or minus a little shouldn't make a major difference on any major recipe. So I just gave it a small sprinkle of salt, a little slather of olive oil, and then this is going in that 400 degree oven that it's, uh, you have to it probably about 25 to 30 minutes. If Flora, you wouldn't mind putting a timer on there for me. Okay, you said about 30 minutes. Yeah, we can do 30 minutes. Okay. All right, so we've got squash in the oven, so we've got ourselves a little bit of time here so that we can formally be introduced. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Antonella aguilera Waste, and I'm a naturopathic doctor. I'm based in California, and I see patients both in Oregon and in California, and really focus on a root cause approach to symptoms. So not only just prescribing something to get away, to alleviate the symptom, but figuring out why it's there in the first place and really partnering with people using food, lifestyle, supplements, and herbs to help bring their body back into balance. Um, and our theme for today is going to be nourishing a healthy brain and a vibrant mood. So really exploring what it looks like to use food as medicine. And we're going to cover the big categories of how food is actually influencing our mood, I'll walk you through some of the studies. We actually have some mounting evidence to show that this isn't maybe just common sense, that there's actually science behind this. And specifically in the recipes that we're cooking today, how they're helping your mood and what those different places are where they're acting. But before we get there, I wanna get to know you guys a little bit and have you guys get to know one another. Um, so Lori, if you'll help me sort of popcorn through people, if you'll introduce yourself, your name, where you're joining us from, and your most used emoji. Okay, let's start with Herschel. Have to unmute. So hi, so Herschel's my son, I'm Catherine, <laughs> um, and I'm here in Sacramento, California. And uh, my most frequently used emoji, it's either the happy, the happy face or the winky face. Happy face or winky face. <laughs> Great, thank you. And then Linda Campbell. And we need you to unmute. Hi. Oops. Got it. Sorry. Linda Campbell, Miami, Florida. Dear friends with, with Catherine Herschel that uh, just spoke. Uh, I work in healthcare and I was really intrigued by the topic of having a healthy brain via food, uh, plus the opportunity to, to have a Zoom cooking class. Uh, so thanks very much for this. Yeah. And my favorite emoji is the smiley face with the sunglasses on. Ooh. <laughs> nice. Okay, thanks. We have, um, a, Natalie, it looks like may have dropped off, is coming back in. Uh, let's go ahead with Patricia. Hi, um, we're in Lincoln, California, and um, favorite emoji is the happy face with heart eyes. Hi. And I'm, I'm Steve Galeria, Pat's husband, and my um, favorite emoji is probably a smiley face and, and just a heart. I love it. Thank you. All right, Sandy, go ahead and unmute. Can you unmute? There you go. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy. I'm in Midtown, about six blocks from the co-op. So I have the good fortune to be able to walk there most days. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry. I'm trying to catch up here. I, um, I, this is my third, third class with the co-op, and I think they're just a blast. Um, and I love learning. I'm a plant-based eater, and I'm also kind of a color slut. So any food that is colorful, colorful, um, I love. And that's what attracted me to this class. Um, emoji favorite, wow. Um, 
I don't use them all that much, but probably a thumbs up mm -hmm. or the little face with the guy vomiting when <laughs> I don't like something. It's green vomit that comes out. <laughs> That's hysterical, Sandy. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Um, Ruth, we'd like to hear from you if you want to unmute. Are you, I do not know how to unmute. Uh, try hitting the space bar. Okay, Ruth, I'm going to go ahead and move on and then we'll, we'll come back. Uh, Joanne. Hi, I'm Joanne. I live in Sacramento, Land Park. We had our power out since 10 o'clock last night, so I was scrambling to get prepared. Um, I've taken the uh, Italian cooking a while ago, a couple years ago, maybe. Um, and I'd say along with similar theme, my favorite emoji is the smiley face with the little hearts around the face. Mm. Aww, nice. Thank you for joining us, Jen. Um, I'm glad, you know, I live in Midtown and I still don't have power. So it's good to hear that you have power. Oh, you do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, welcome. All righty. And then how about James? Did you unmute me? Oh, hi, Ruth. Yes, hi. go ahead, Ruth. Yes, hi. My name is Ruth Merritt and I enjoy cooking. And uh, Brandy Waite signed me up for the class. I'm a friend of hers and her mother-in-law. I enjoy cooking, and I'm especially interested in nurturing my brain food because I have had an experience recently with a sister that had difficulties with dementia, and that's why I really am interested in your class. Great. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you so much. James, are you there? Yes, hi. Uh uh, this is James, and my wife Elaine has uh, joined us, and uh, we uh, love shopping at the co-op and uh, love uh, healthy uh, eating and cooking and looking forward to this class. Um, favorite emoji? Mine, I think, might be the coffee cup. But, uh, <laughs> I like that, but a thumbs up and smiley face, too. But, uh, nice. Uh, That's great. Thank you so much. And let's see, Ka oh, Kathy. Got it. I'm Kathy, I live in Sacramento in the Curtis Park neighborhood. And I too love the smiley face with the heart eyes paired with the heart. I thought I was the only one who did that. I consider it my signature sign off on all my texts. Um, I've taken many, many cooking classes at the co-op in person, but this is my very first Zoom class. I was a vegan for four years, but now I'm not. And I transitioned back to being more on the Mediterranean diet. And I believe it was a class I took with Dr. Antonella wow. that really made me comfortable switching back to that. Mm. So um, I've long admired your work and I'm looking forward to finding out how I can preserve my brain because I cook all the time and I love the idea of food as medicine. Good. That Lori, I'm just going to interrupt. I, let's continue to go through introductions, but while we finish up the last couple people, I'm just going to start sauteing the onions for people who are cooking at home. So we've got some olive oil in a medium warm pan. We're just going to start cooking these down. It's going to be about 10 minutes, so I'll just work on these while we finish up our intro. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing. Um, Jessica, have we talked to you yet? Hi everybody, um, my name is Jessica. I too am a co-op fan and an Antonella fan. Um, so I'm happy to be here tonight. My favorite uh, emoji is probably the one where he's looking up and thinking. Oh, that's a good one. That's I use great. that one a lot. I love it, thank <laughs> you. And Natalie, how about you? Um, I've been cutting in and out, so I don't know if you'll get me the whole time. Um, I've done some of the co-op classes in person, and I really enjoyed those. Um, I've, I'm not a Zoom person. This is my son put me up here. 
Um, I, as far as cooking, I Oh, I think you've cut out anything new and so, um, yep, it says unstable, so I don't know if you're oh. hearing me or not hearing me. We um, heard we heard a little bit. Um, but I like the idea of having a healthy brain since I am getting up there in the years. Um, so this will be a good class. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, is that everybody? Uh, if there's anybody I missed, would you please unmute and pop in? Okay, I think that might be everybody. Okay. Yeah? yeah? Okay. All right, so we've got onions simmering for those of you at home. I just gave them a good coat of olive oil, if you guys can see in there, just so they're shiny and glistening. glistening. Um, and we're, that's gonna take about 10 minutes. So while those guys are sauteing, I'm gonna give them a stir here and there, but I wanna talk about broad ideas when we're thinking about brain health. So when I think about brain health, I'm thinking in terms of mood, of concerns like anxiety and depression, but I'm also thinking in terms of longevity, ways and strategies that we're preventing dementia, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline. And so we'll, we'll sort of dance between those different diagnoses or concerns and the data is a little bit different for each of them. But in general, what we're talking about is using diet to replete nutrition. So we know that there's some really brain specific nutrients. We're also using diet to affect inflammation. So inflammation is that immune response that we need when we have an acute cold, but when it becomes chronic and we've just got this smoldering inflammation, we know that that causes issues. It can cause damage in the brain. It can cause mood disturbances. It can be the root cause of anxiety. So we can use diet to really introduce anti-inflammatory signaling. And then the third big idea of how we're affecting brain and mood through the diet is by regulating gut flora and feeding a healthy gut. So this gut brain access is connected through something called the vagus nerve. All to say that if you've got an unhappy inflamed gut, that's going to be telling the brain to essentially be inflamed and unhappy. So if we can calm the gut, create a really healthy garden of different gut bacteria, that's going to help create proper neurotransmitters, cool down inflammation, and send really positive signaling up to the brain. So these are the main mechanisms by which diet is affecting brain and mood health. So in our recipes, what we're highlighting is how to use this in practice, how to like actually cook with these things. So you'll see that we're using a lot of different colors. We're using a lot of different plant food categories. And I'm happy to touch on animal protein if people have questions around that. So in my mind, this is being complemented with other sources of protein. This is the vegetable part of this story. And we're going to use spices. There's lots of spices and herbs poked into everything because that's going to really turn up the anti-inflammatory nature of what we're eating. Okay, so any questions on that sort of broad overview of this topic? Because it's a big one. I, I just wanted to add a comment that I, I recently learned about a newsletter um, that Maria Shriver puts out just on Sundays called the oh. Sunday Paper. Maybe you're familiar. And just um, on Sunday, she interviewed Sanjay Gupta um, about his new book on brain health, and they talked quite a bit about food. So this is very timely. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, the same things that you're saying. I good, yeah. good. Yeah, so I'm not the only crazy one out there. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's just, um, yeah, really um, important dynamics. So, yeah. So, um I think where I want to focus in first is like, is nutrition. What are these nutrients that we know that are good for mood um, and good for building a healthy brain? So researchers got together. One of the researchers is a doctor named Drew Ramsey, which you might know of. He's a psychiatrist who's really done a lot of research in nutritional psychiatry. And they found that there was a set of nutrients that was really specific 
for affecting mood concerns in the brain. And they called this the antidepressant food score. Mm. So they, they found that things like vitamin A, zinc, B vitamins, vitamin E, vitamin B12 were all really important in brain function. And, and some of those mechanisms is by lowering inflammation. But these were the nutrients that we needed in order to have a healthy brain. So then they went through and looked at all the different research and found the studies that supported that. And then they went through to the foods to see where are these nutrients most concentrated. Essentially, where are we getting most bang for our buck in terms of brain healthy nutrients? And what they found was that there were two categories, right? There was proteins and vegetables. So the vegetables were the stars of the show. They are the ones that have all of those nutrients that we need. And at the top of that vegetable list were greens, cruciferous vegetables, and herbs. So if you take home anything, those are brain healthy foods. And the more we can get them in, the better. So you'll see that we've got a beautiful butternut squash. We're gonna do a cruciferous salad with fresh herbs. So those are all those really brain healthy nutrients. On the other side, they found that the proteins that had all of those nutrients and greater concentrations came mostly from the ocean. Those were the top performers. So things like clams, mussels, cold water fish like salmon and seafood. So all of these recipes could be paired with a really nice piece of wild salmon, for example, and you've got yourself a brain healthy menu. So as we're going through, I'll highlight um, some of the specific nutrients that we're getting in all of those foods, but you'll see we've got herbs, we've got spices, and all of those made that antidepressant food list in ways of keeping the brain really healthy and happy. Okay, so how are you guys' onions looking at home? Um, they're coming along. Can, can I ask another question? Yeah. I've live, so I've got two, but I'll just do one. Okay. Can you tell me the difference between cumin and coriander, ground coriander? I got both at the co-op, mm -hmm. and I don't know if they're the same and just labeled differently or if there's a difference. So they're different. Oh, Jessica, awesome. Some salmon. Yes. So they are different. So cumin comes from cumin seed. Coriander is actually uh, the seed of cilantro. So when you let cilantro go to seed, it becomes coriander. That seed becomes okay. coriander. You dry it out. And then the cumin seed, we don't have it here, but it's a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the coriander is like an actual circle. Um, okay. They have complementary flavors, but I would say the cumin is much more pungent than the coriander. The coriander is a little bit more fragrant and perfumey. And they often go together in Middle Eastern or Mediterranean recipes. So they ground, they look very similar if you got them okay. ground. They're very right. hard to tell apart, but they'll smell very different too. Okay, thank you yeah. very much. You're welcome. Okay, so let me walk you through how the onions are looking. I just wanna say whenever you are ready to, or hopefully we'll address this, is about the proteins and about the animal sources versus vegetable sources. I'm interested to hear your thoughts about that. You mentioned fish. Yeah, interested to hear more generally your thoughts about that and yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, I'm gonna show you guys onions. You can see in there, so they're like yeah. most translucent. They're starting to stick a little bit to the bottom, get a tiny bit of caramelization. So at this point, I'm gonna uh, throw in the garlic, which we did just a rough chop. And I tend to like to do garlic later on in the cooking process so that it doesn't burn. I personally don't like the taste of burnt garlic. I just like that more garlic flavor. So we did it pretty rough and we're going to throw it in. And remember, we're going to puree it. That's why nothing has been precious up to this point. Just rough, get it in the pot. So this is the uh, garlic that's going in. So that's gonna take maybe a minute or so. And then we're gonna add in all the spices. So we're gonna do cumin, coriander, and cinnamon. So something warm, something a little bit more savory, which is in that cumin, and then a little bit floral of the coriander. If I actually, you guys are gonna start to get to know my quirks and I have very strong opinions about things I like and don't like. 
So I don't like coriander. It makes me nauseous. I love cilantro. Coriander is just not my thing. So the recipe actually has a little bit less than what you could use. So if you like those flavors, you could up the coriander and even do the same quantity as the cumin. So I'm going to throw those into our onions and garlic. Um, the cumin did not print on my printer. Can you tell me how much to put in? It's a teaspoon. Okay. Okay, and then we're just gonna give that a quick saute. Love everyone watching. I love watching everyone at home in their kitchens. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Okay, so I started a kettle of water because we're going to need some boiling water for the lentils. Okay, so next step here is that we've got to get the lentils into the pan. So these are some red lentils. Lentils are a really wonderful source of two things. One is fiber, which we'll talk about why that's so important for gut health. The second is that it's high in folate, which is one of those B vitamins that's really good for the brain. And lentils are a really good source of folate, as are leafy greens. Um, so we're using red lentils. They're going to get nice and creamy and make our uh, soup a little bit more robust. Um, but this is uh, three-fourths of a cup of red lentils. Could you repeat the benefits of lentils that cut out for me? Yes. Let me get the water in, and I'll repeat them, Kathy. Okay. All right, so you are going to add a quart of boiling water. I'm gonna add a quart of lukewarm water. And that's four and, cups. Yeah, that's four cups, because I got distracted here. Um, is that to the lentils or for the soup? That's not, that's not the broth, right? It's not the broth, right? It's separate from the broth. It's just to the lentils for the soup. Okay. So is that in the soup pot you're doing? Sorry, I can't yes. see it on the darn yes. phone. In the soup okay. pot. Yeah, so boiling water goes in with the lentils in the soup pot. Catherine, you have a question, it seems like. I do. So the lentils that we call for the split, the red lentils are split. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, that's okay. right. Yeah, those are perfect. Great. Okay, so I'm going to bring my pot up to a boil. Um, just so I'm on gas over here so we can get this to boil pretty quickly and then I'm going to cover it and let it simmer for 10 minutes. So is everybody up to that? Is that step clear? So you've got lentils in the pot with your onions and you're putting a quart of boiling water over it and then letting it simmer for 10 minutes. So we don't use the broth or later? Uh, we haven't used the broth yet. Okay. So we, um, already that we just haven't used it yet. And water, did you say three cups of water? Four cups. Four cups of boiling water. Yeah. Okay. And then I also add the onion mixture into the lentil pot. Exactly. Okay, got it. Yes. Um, okay, so I'm going to let these, let me turn these guys down and so that they're simmering. Okay, I'm sorry. I did miss that one part. I had put the lentils into the water, and you said the onions now into the lentils and water? So I think Sandy, is Sandy, is that your name? Did I catch that right? Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, yes. So I think what Sandy, what, you might, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have the lentils with the water in one pot, and you're going to put the onions in them. In yes. There. That works. Joanne, what I did, and I'm not saying that this is better, is that in the same pot that I was sauteing everything, I threw in the lentils, and then I put in the boiling water. Oh, Okay. I have them in two separate pots right now, currently. Okay, yeah, so just get them together in a pot that you can eventually add squash to. Okay. See, and this is the beauty of this, is that it's gonna work in the end, and there's so many routes to the same destination. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we've got ourselves, we've got one pot with all of that business up to the lentils, and we're letting it simmer. Kathy, I'm gonna loop back, so lentils are high in folate as well as high in fiber. And folate is one of those brain healthy nutrients that we need in order to fight inflammation, keep brain communication happy, 
and really put a check on the immune system. And so it's high in lentils. It's also high in leafy greens. So folate comes from the word foliage in Latin. And so if you think of leafy greens, things that have lots of foliage are gonna be high in folate. Um, and then they're also gonna be high in fiber. And we need that fiber in order to feed good gut bacteria in the gut um, so that we're seeding it with really good food. So the lentils hit both of those categories. Okay. Can I ask another question? Yeah. Okay, what if you have a stomach that gets sensitive to, a, you know, like when you're trying to increase your bean and legume intake and then your stomach just goes cuckoo crazy? Yes, yes. that's a really good question. So one is that you can try soaking those legumes beforehand. So like for this recipe, like say you're going to make it around this time, I would put those lentils to soak in the morning, just put fresh water over them, let them sit on the counter, rinse, strain them, and then use them and proceed with the recipe so that you're soaking them. So you're essentially pre-digesting them so that they're a little bit easier to assimilate. You could also start low and slow and slowly build up. So one of the good responses our body has to that increased fiber is that the bacteria start to fight it out. Like the bad ones are like, God, I don't really like all this fiber. The good ones are like, yes, more fiber. I'm also going to create more gas. And you're like, oh, this feels not good in the tummy. So you can go like slow, low and slow, like do just a quarter of a cup every few days and slowly work up so that you build that tolerance and you almost have to like let things adjust in the gut and get on the other side of it. Another strategy there could be to incorporate bitters. So that can be like a bitter tincture of a really classic combination is called Swedish bitters, has bitter herbs like gentian and um, milk thistle and ginger. And then you can do a couple of drops of that before meals to help prep digestion. So it's a little bit more efficient assimilating those things. So those are some basic ones to try, but usually I find that soaking is really the major thing that can really help. Um, and sometimes that you don't get, like if you use canned beans, they're not necessarily soaked. But the red lentils, especially if you soak those, they sort of disintegrate and get really mushy that they're a nice place to start to build some tolerance for those legumes. Okay. I have a question. Yes, and then we'll go back to Catherine's question on protein. Oh, no, go, no, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, no, Sam. Go ahead. No, jump in. Oh, okay, um, because I, I just inhale legumes, um, all different ones. I love the red ones because of the color yeah. and they're faster. Um, I also have an Instapot, but I have found that, I mean, uh, anything more than a minute and a half and they are liquefied, so different from their green or brown counterparts. Yeah. It, can you ever have red lentils that are a little more intact or are they meant to be I think they're pulverized? Meant yeah, I think they're meant to like disintegrate like a doll that you think more like puree rather than whole lentils. So that's why I like it, for example, for an introduction into legumes or a soup that it adds like bulk and creaminess more okay. so than actual like texture that a true like a brown lentil or a beluga black lentil will have like you can actually bite okay. into it. Yeah, they just sort of fall apart like a split pea kind of. Right. Okay. I, I just kept thinking I was blowing it because I couldn't no, keep it. No, going. I don't think you are. Or I have been blowing it and we're part of the blowing it crowd. But yeah, I don't think you are. I don't think you are. Um, okay, let me make sure that was simmering. And then we'll get to Catherine's question. Okay, so Catherine, I think you raised a good question about proteins in general. And I've got a convert here on the, on the class of Kathy. Um, so really... You know, looking at mood, but then also, oh, have you tried? Okay, I'll get to the question in a second, Shelly, when I saw your question. Um, so looking at that antidepressant mood score, when they looked at those proteins, really the ones that were super high on that list were animal proteins, particularly seafood, but next up on there was things like organ meats and beef liver and then beef. So my take home from that is I know that there's really big opinions on meat and protein, and I'm really not an advocate of either side. I think a combination of both is really where you get the richest nutrient density. So I think using meat as a condiment, never making it central to the plate, like I intentionally left meat off of this menu because it's easy to add 
a piece of grilled salmon or a little piece of steak or prawns or whatever your preferences are, really focusing in on that vegetables. But meat sources also have a lot of very bioavailable nutrients that are much harder to get from plants. So they really do complement each other. The other place, especially in terms of brain health, that animal protein, especially seafood shines, is that it is the source of omega-3s in the diet. So you can't really get that many omega-3s from plant sources. There are some as in flaxseed or walnuts, but they're not converted as efficiently to EPA and DHA, which are the fatty acids that exist in the brain. And the brain is majority DHA. So if you want food sources of omega-3s, those come from fish and seafood. So I am an advocate of quality there. We really want to be mindful about what kind of um, investment we're making in the food system. So I'm always going to advocate for wild sources of those things, looking at things like the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, and then also advocating for regenerative agriculture on beef or poultry or whatever that other protein is. Um, and I work in a population where we're balancing blood sugar, we're really trying to use food as medicine, that I find a complement of animal sources and plant protein sources is really, is really sort of the middle ground. And it's also why I like the Mediterranean diet so much, because it's agnostic to being carnivorous or vegan on either side. Antonella, go ahead and check your squash. Thank you. And then in about two minutes, um, you'll be um, checking your soup. Awesome. All right, so you guys can hopefully see the squash here. Um, I'm going to use a knife, but if you're at home cooking, you probably have a fork. And yeah, this is tender. So we're going to cook it again. So it doesn't have to be like puree tender. You don't necessarily have to be able to smash it with a fork. Um, but this has been a half hour. So you'll see it just is on the soft side, and then I'm just gonna put it to the side so that I can add it to the soup in a couple of minutes. Okay, so let me do a quick go through that we've got all our pieces here. And then somebody had asked about the um, green lentils. Oh yeah, green lentils, that was Shelly. Hi Shelly, nice to see you. Um, the green lentils, so I haven't made this with green lentils, and I think this is like a red lentil specific soup. I think you could use green lentils, but you're not gonna get the same consistency and you're also gonna get a very funny color at the end because you're gonna get that green with the orange of the squash. Um, and it's just gonna look a funny color at the end. So I think the red lentils, because they disintegrate and get so uh, mushy are specific to this. Um, yeah, so I haven't tried it with green, but if you, I think it would still taste good with green. You just want to cook them a little bit more till you get them really soft so that you can puree them. Okay. Any other questions there? No, okay. This might be jumping ahead, but when I went to the store um, to get the, how do I pronounce the? Radicchio, Radicchio. Radicchio. Um, uh, one time years ago, I mistakenly uh, bought that thinking it was red cabbage and mm -hmm. it was ghastly um, for what I was making. So I have a little bit of an aversion and the produce manager was showing me that there's two different kinds yeah. mm -hmm. and this was beautiful. And then this was the traditional. Yes. And because I seemed confused, I guess them. they said, why don't you take them both as a free sample? Oh, oh wonderful. So I did. So I know nothing about them and neither did they. So they okay. asked, well, yeah. maybe the instructor will know. I will. That's why we chose Red Ikkyo. Yes. That's why you need to be green. Um, so actually, let's get, that's actually our next step. So. Okay, never mind. I just yeah, thought I'd point that out that. Do you guys feel comfortable moving on to the next step? Yes. Okay. Um, so let me wipe down my knife a second here and then get my greens. So we're going to start on the salad. We're going to jump a little bit back and forth here um, just to make sure we're getting everything. So let me give this a quick wipe down. Oops. And I put the recipe in the trash. And you have about a half hour. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to prep our greens for the salad and let me get the bowl. And then your three minutes um, 
you uh, are up for the soup, so I don't know if the squash needs to go in. Yeah, so let me, okay, so back to the soup. We're gonna throw in the squash and then the rest of the ingredients. Can I ask, how long was that supposed to go? Because mine's not even boiling. Is it supposed to boil or? Yeah, it was supposed to go about 10 minutes. Okay. And did you add boiling water to the pot? I didn't. Oh. That's okay. I didn't either because I forgot because I was talking. But let yours go another 10 minutes. Just bring it up to a quick boil. Let it go another 10 minutes, then add your squash. Okay. Um, okay. So then your cooked squash goes in the pot. And then, let me just make sure. Then at this point, we're gonna add the lemon juice, the stock, a teaspoon of salt, which I'm just gonna eyeball, but if you've got a teaspoon at home, go ahead and use that. And then we're gonna do three cups of chicken stock and just bring it up to a simmer. And Sandy, you can use, I know you're vegan, so you can use vegetable stock. Yeah. I already made it. Oh, look at you. And look, your pink glasses are back. I'm so happy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so that's just going to simmer. It's going to do its thing for about 15 minutes. If anything's on the hard end, then just let it simmer a little bit longer. So at this point, the soup's almost done. We're just going to finish it off with some toppings. I'll set the timer for 15. Yeah, awesome, Lori, thank you. Okay, so we've got these brain healthy plant foods. So we talked about lentils, we've got onions, garlic, we've got all that jazz in the soup pot, but now we really want to go heavy on <coughs> cruciferous vegetables, leafy greens and herbs, and we're gonna bring them all together in this salad. So what we're, we're gonna use is red ikkyo, and as Sandy showed us, there's two types. This is like a more traditional red ikkyo, and then you've got the longer red ikkyo, which is actually called Treviso. Um, but they're just Italian bitter greens. So they are hearty. You can grill them. You can make risotto mm. with them. They're going to be just bitter. And that's it, it, the preparation here matters because they can be a little bit strong on the palate. So you're going to see, we're going to make them with uh, like, citrusy, sweet, savory dressing that's going to help cut some of that bitterness. So hopefully it'll be a nice introduction to these leafy greens. Um, but the radicchio I just halved, your radicchio might have a core, more like more look like a cabbage. It might have like a little white core. You just want to triangle it out. So this one doesn't really have a core in it for whatever reason. But if it did, which a lot of times it does, I would just make a slit that looks like this and it would get that core out. So yours at home might actually have that core. So you'll just have something that looks like this. Can you guys see that on the camera? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and Sandy, since you got the same one at the co-op, you probably won't have a core either. Yeah. So I've got that, you mean, so just do like oh, a, yeah, little cut v, that out. a little surgical V exactly. cut? Yeah, just do like a, yeah, like a V cut so that you get rid of that piece. Okay. Exactly. Okay. All right, so then at this point, we're just gonna shave it thin. So nothing fancy, just across the grain, really thin strips. The thinner you go, the less whopping the bitter flavor will be. So if you are a little bit nervous about the bitter, just go super thin, as thin as your knife and skill will let you. And then we're gonna throw that in the bowl. Do you have to wash the inside of it or, or is it good to go? So Lori did wash them. I am notorious. I don't really wash my vegetables <laughs> unless they came like from the garden and then I rinse off a little bit of dirt. But um, it's not going to have a lot of dirt in it, like a leek wood, for example, um, or an on dot, or excuse me, like a frisee. So they're usually pretty dirt free because they're really compact in the ground and then you're just cutting them at the core. So you're probably good if you just give it a rinse on the outside. Okay. 
All right, so then that's just cut thin. And into the bowl. And then I went ahead and prepped most of the celery. So I pulled, I picked off all the leaves. So a lot of times these get thrown away, but they're perfectly good and leafy and full of nutrients too. So I just picked off the leaves of the celery and those are gonna go in whole into that salad bowl. And then I cut the celery about a quarter of an inch thick. So if you guys can see, oh gosh, just not super, super thin. Um, I'm gonna cut through one. I just did it on an angle and it's about a quarter of an inch. Mm -hmm. And then that goes into the salad. This is here on the plastic. Okay, so while you guys finish up chopping, I'm just going to throw in the parsley leaves. Those I just picked. We're not even going to chop these either. Again, this is just like a celebration of all good things for the brain. Um, and so we kept everything pretty whole. We wanted to have some texture to it. So these are just parsley leaves pulled off. Off the stems. Okay, so this is the star of the show is our cauliflower. So this is like a tiny little head of cauliflower. Your recipe calls for half of a normal head, so we thought that this small one would be equivalent to like half a big one. Um, but it's your call. You, yeah, it's your call. It's about half a medium cauliflower. So I'm going to do this on a mandolin so that it's shaved really thin because cauliflower isn't something that we commonly eat raw and we want it to be as paper thin as we can. So to get it ready, I'm just gonna split it down the middle. And then I'm just gonna trim this piece. I'm just gonna trim this piece and then get my, because I actually don't want to pour it out because I don't want it to fall apart on the mandolin. So I'm just going to leave it as it is. And then let me grab the, uh, the mandolin. Okay. So this can be achieved with, a, if you have a sharp knife, you could do this with a sharp knife. If you have a blade on the food processor, you could do it thinly sliced in the food processor and just run it through. That will work. I'm going to show you on the mandolin here. And I'm going to try and not cut myself. Okay. Lori, I might have asked you how to use this. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I think I know. Okay. I think I'm figuring it out. What if the cauliflower is bigger than the, the width of the cauliflower is bigger than the width of the mandolin? Then you can quarter it. Then you can cut it just into a smaller chunk. Okay. So that, yeah. I'm a first, first time mandolin user. Yeah. Okay. Is that more right. for you? Yeah, mandolin, sharp knife. Then you're just gonna get a thin slice. Thank you. So you essentially want it to look like this. It's like paper thin, just paper thin, like little broccoli pieces. And then I'm wearing a glove because I like always shred and cut my fingers. And then I've also got this finger protector with the plastic. But we just want to get that cauliflower really thin. Can I ask you a question about that? Yes. Is the idea it needs to be in neat slices or it just needs to be thin so it'll cr all crumble up? Just needs to be thin. Yeah, so it just needs to be thin. So it's just to make it a little bit easier on the palate when, we, when we're done here. Yeah, so it'll crumble up and be thin. So we essentially want it to look like this. Can you guys see that? Sort of. And let me, here, I'm gonna just sprinkle it into the bowl. Yeah. See? There you go. Yeah, and the contrast with the green. That's pretty. In there, hopefully. Yeah, so you can see that. 
Does yeah. it end up looking like cauliflower rice a little bit? A little bit, a little bit with some thinner pieces, with some thinner pieces. Okay, so are you using the whole core of the cauliflower as well? Just yeah, because that's what's holding the florets okay. together. So yeah, I'm getting some of that really thin so that it holds and then some of it will crumble out, but that's okay. The crumblies work. And then Where do you buy the special glove? Um, I'm sure you can grab it, get one on Amazon. Oh, okay. Like William Sonoma or a Sir Le Tab would have it. Okay. Wow, this is very cool. All right, so we've got super thin cauliflower going in, and then all of these little bits, you can just go at it with the knife, just to get them crumbly and small. so that we're not missing anything. Okay. Oh, yes. Are you guys still with me? I'm in like a cauliflower. <laughs> Looks like it snowed cauliflower over here. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's get to the dressing and then we can answer questions. Lori, we have till 5.30, is that correct? An hour and a half? Yeah, but I wanna give it, let's, let's give you about 15.20 so that we have time. Got it. Uh, Got it. So let's do dressings and then we'll do some take homes, some summaries, um, and then answer any questions. All right. So now we're making dressing. Okay, so for our dressing, I've got some dates that have just been pitted and chopped, some jewel dates, a teaspoon of Dijon mustard, We've got an orange that I juiced. And I actually juiced about one and a half lemons. The recipe says two. It's like two small, medium lemons. So I would start with one and then we're gonna taste it as we go. Cause sometimes two big lemons could be too much lemon juice. So this is where the art of cooking comes in and just trust your taste buds. It's, it's gonna work out. And then I'm gonna throw these all into just the normal Pyrex, because we're gonna blend it together with a hand blender. So I've got the olive oil, the Dijon mustard, the dates, a little teaspoon of water, just to help everything blend up, orange juice, and then I'm going to do most of the lemon juice, but I'm going to hold back a little just because I don't want it to be too tart and give it a good pinch of salt. And then I've got an immersion blender here, but you could use a normal blender um, at home. It doesn't have to be a fancy uh, immersion blender. So I'm just going to immerse it and blend it up. And so when you taste it, you want it to be a little bit on the tart side and you want it to be a little bit strong because remember the cauliflower, the radicchio, all of those are really strong flavors. So you want to pucker a little bit when you taste the dressing. To taste it for salt, see if you need to add in more lemon juice, any more salt. Then we're going to throw the chives into the salad. That was our last herb. I'm going to just check in with Sandy. Sandy, you know it was a half of a cauliflower, right? Oh, thank you, Lord. Okay. <laughs> Does anybody else have cauliflower all over the floor? <laughs> I do, too. I've never it's used like a mandolin. Like it exploded. I do, too. It's, it's my neighbors. It is like everywhere. <laughs> like a pillow open. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Lori, because I've got a lot. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> okay, so we've got our dressing blended. 
We've got all those beautiful greens in the bowl. So we've got the radicchio, the greens, the whites. Again, this idea of color. So that color is means that they're rich in phytonutrients, which is just a fancy word for saying all those chemicals that do antioxidant activity in the body. They help protect the brain. They clean up messes. They fight against inflammation. They help clean up in those biochemical reactions. So all of that color really is the signal that that's happening. We'll have that orange in the soup. We've got that deep red and purple, the greens, the whites. And then we're gonna finish it off. We're gonna dress your dressing. I actually need to blend mine a little bit more, probably in the Vitamix, because the dates were sticky. Um, but you guys will blend it. And then we're just gonna finish the salad off with some walnuts. So I just like to smush them in my hand and crumble them over the salad. We don't even really need to take a knife to them. And just give it a crumble. Those walnuts are high in fiber, high in healthy fats, really good for the brain. That's gonna go over the top. And then you've got your dressing. Okay, so any questions on salad? Um, how did you, like with your flowers, I mean your leaves? Yeah. Did you put a whole celery leaf yeah. like this in or, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I always thought you should throw these out. Yeah, okay. I just put the whole leaves in there. Oh boy. They're my favorite part of the celery. Yeah, and all the dates got caught in this immersion blender. So I'm gonna try it after we're done in the Vitamix. If that happens to you at home, Again, right? Nothing really ever goes according to plan. Um, if that happens to you at home, you can actually take a fork and right on your cutting board, you can mash up the dates into a puree and then mix that with everything. It'll make it easier on your blender. You won't get those little pieces stuck in there. Uh, so if you're troubleshooting at that home. Are you 15 minutes uh, okay. are up? All right. So. How are we on the soup, Lori? On yeah, the that, that's the timer just went off for your soup. Okay. All right. So let me just make sure that that's cooked through. We might need five more minutes before we finish it off. Hmm. When I'm looking in the pot, I just want to make sure that the lentils are soft and they are falling apart, which is what should happen. I'm giving it a quick taste for salt and making sure that the squash is cooked through. So I'm going to leave it five more minutes, if you would, please. Got it. And then I'm adding a little bit more salt. Okay. All right. So to recap everything we've talked about, because I know there's been recipe doing, brain thinking, this class in and of itself is good for your brain. We've got connection. We've got doing something new. We've got eating really good food. So there's those aspects to it too. But again, that we're really focusing on all those anti-inflammatory ingredients. So you saw a big variety of colors. We've got orange. We've got white browns in the onions and garlic. We've got the cauliflower, radicchio, which hopefully maybe is a new leafy green to you variety here. We're also um, getting all of those brain healthy nutrients. So we've got folate, B vitamins, zinc, all of those different sources. Um, we've got fiber from the lentil that we're eating. That squash also has that fiber and that really vibrant color. So all of that is helping feed healthier gut flora. And then finally that we're combining this with things like seafood, wild salmon, sardines, for example, beef liver, to get that complement of nutrition. And that while we're feeding that really good gut flora, we also talked about those strategies of like legumes don't sit that well, maybe other things that we can try. Um, but this is really the model, just fresh vegetables, 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 prepared in a way that's delicious, that has that variety. We've also got those nuts and seeds in there, those other sources of fat. So that's a model for you to take forward in terms of eating for good mood and really helping to protect and maintain your brain. So any brain mood questions before we finish off with the soup? Mm. How's your dressings in the cooking? 
the cooking houses. I haven't gotten to the immersion yet, and I think okay. I'll do it later. <laughs> That's okay. It's hard to do so many things at once. I can just over my just, power laden cutting board. I actually made the dressing earlier, and it, it turned out really okay. well. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I, the interesting thing about the salad that occurs to me, because I also really love salads, but we know salads with lettuce or spinach just woo, go mm -hmm. wimpy. And this looks like it would be a little bit more robust that it could last a few a few more days. Yeah. Not, not like the you know traditional one that it's hard to keep a perpetual salad going. Absolutely. And I was actually gonna say, right, we're doing the cruciferous vegetable raw in a different way, right? We're doing the radicchio raw, which sometimes can be an adjustment digestively. So if that's the case, you can also dress it half an hour or an hour ahead. So you get some of that acid breaking it down and you're actually wilting it a little bit. This is a sound uh -huh. that can take that. Actually mm -hmm. sitting in the dressing for a bit might be a really nice way to just mellow everything out, have it combined and make it actually a little bit easier to digest. So that's always an option. It doesn't have to be necessarily fresh. And it's a really versatile salad. You could put some hard boiled eggs in there. You could add some green lentils or black lentils. You could add some garbanzo beans. You could add lots of other pieces to it, but you've got this beautiful base um, that's just gonna be so nutritionally dense and really delicious. Give you those bitter flavors, that citrusy sweet dressing. I think it's just a surprise that cauliflower can be that good. Um, yeah. Can you also maybe, if you just really found the radicchio doesn't work, could you substitute red cabbage? Yeah, you absolutely could. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. yeah, you can do it really thin. It's going to give you that beautiful color and it's going to be in the cruciferous family. So you could totally do uh, red cabbage. Yeah, it'll be a little bit more like on the mustardy side rather than the bitter side, but that's a perfect uh, okay. profile that would work as well. Um, yeah, so let me make sure I didn't miss anything that I wanted to share with you guys. I think we talked about it. So let's finish up the soup and then we'll tie up with any questions. Does that sound good, Lori? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So we're going to emerge and blend the soup as well. I'm going to turn that guy off. Okay. So I'm going to put the soup here so you guys can see me blend it. I know you can't see from overhead. But we're literally just going to blend it till it's smooth. And you could also do this in a blender. Just be careful when it's hot that it's not exploding off the top. So you want to do it in batches. rough blend right now. I'll finish it off because I think you guys will get this step of just blending it till it's pureed. Once it's blended and smooth, then you'll just want to give it a final taste. I have it roughly blended, which you could leave it roughly blended. If you don't like baby food soups, you could leave it roughly blended. I like my soups to be like baby food, personally. Okay, so we need a little bit more salt. And then I'm going to add a little bit more lemon juice. So again, you're just going to come in and taste. Like, does it need a little bit more acidity, a little bit more salt? I'm going to add a little bit more lemon juice that I saved from the other salad. And then when you serve, we're going to serve it with more herbs. So green cilantro. Well, cilantro is always green. So cilantro that was just roughly chopped. Pour that on the top of your soup. And then this is um, some Zatar spice blend. So Zatar is a Middle Eastern spice blend that has um, a wild thyme, sumac, and sesame seeds. I included a recipe that you can approximate in your recipe packet. If you don't have Zatar, if you can't find it, but now it's more commercially available, already made, you can make your own. But it's 
like woodsy and fragrant. It's a little bit tart from that sumac. It's got those sesame seeds, which again are rich in all of those brain healthy nutrients. And then we're just gonna sprinkle that over the top and then you can finish it off with a drizzle, drizzle excuse me, of olive oil. And again, just other ways to get spices in that's gonna boost that anti-inflammatory component of your actual dish. And it's also going to taste delicious. So you'll finish off your soup with the, with the za'atar and then you're good to go. So any questions on that? Any other questions? Kathy, go ahead. Yeah, Kathy. I was just curious about the final consistency because it seemed like a lot of fluid proportionally to the amount of um, other ingredients. Yeah, so it should be creamy. So it'll be like, um, trying to think of like a common soup. Like, oh, a like a tomato soup, essentially, like that sort of creaminess. I'm just having a heck of a time with this particular version, Blender. Um, it's getting, it's a little clunky, but it should be, it should be creamy and smooth um, and silky. Okay. And if it's a little bit chunky, which has happened to me before, I actually just need to add a little bit more liquid and keep blending. And then you can also drizzle a little bit more olive oil as you're blending because it will emulsify slightly. You'll get some of that emulsification with the water and it will become really creamy. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually a recipe. I have a little video of it on my website. So you could Google in the blog, you could put in red lentils in the search. Um, and it, this will pop up and there's a little video that you can see the finished product on there as well. That is creamy. And it'll walk you through all the steps really quickly in like a minute as well. What is your website? So it is AntonellaAguilaraND.com. I don't know, Lori, if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat. Uh, yeah. Spell. Might be easier for people to see. Yeah, let me, um, am I doing this right? Antonella. Aguilera. And and then, dot com. A G. U I. L E R. Thank you, Shelly. Oh, did she do it? She oh, did. thank you, Shelly. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Will this soup freeze well if you want to make extra portions? Yes, I think it will. I, I'm trying to remember if I have frozen it, which I think I have, but yes, it freezes well and you can defrost it in the fridge. If you like it a little bit spicier, can you just add the cumin and the coriander at the end? A little bit more of that? Absolutely, yes, yes. Yeah, so definitely when you're doing that taste, do the acidity, but if you want it punchier, Add a little bit more cumin, add a little bit more coriander, add a little bit more cinnamon, find that balance. Okay. If you like things spicy, this is a soup that you could add a little red chili flakes to mm. it. You could also finish it off with a little sriracha if you like red and spicy. That'd be another wonderful way to get another pigment, another color into the mix um, if you like spicy. If you like hot spicy, including spicy spices. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or confusion? Kathy. Well, it's not a question about the recipe, but about something you said earlier. So if anyone else has questions on the recipes, I will defer to them. But you mentioned that you're a little loose and fast about washing vegetables, and I've yeah. become that way too. And I, I buy all organic, mm -hmm. so I figure it's probably good if there's a little soil in. I mean, if they're obviously dirty or have, um, you know, little bugs or something, then I wash that off. But more yeah. and more, I'm not so much. Yeah, and that's really my reasoning, right? Is that I think in a lot of ways, we, we've become very sterile in our approach to our bodies. And we are seeing the negative impact of that, that our immune system doesn't get triggered as much. We have these development challenges that we're not like on a farm being exposed to lots of different bacteria we have more allergies more autoimmune so yeah if you're buying organic i think a little dirt is nothing we should be scared of that's traditionally a way that we were inoculated with these bacteria um that i sort of think it's probably okay to be exposed you know there's conditions and places where that wouldn't be appropriate if someone has cancer and they're dealing with specific situations that you want to be really careful about things that could trigger an immune response. 
But in general, yeah, I'm not fussy about cleaning my food. And I think this isn't the first time I've mentioned it, but Kathy, thank you for bringing that up because, yeah, I figure a little bacteria is probably good for us. Thank you for confirming that for me. <laughs> yeah. Other questions or closing thoughts? This is more of a technique question, but um, I struggle a little bit with cauliflower. Um, I mean, if you're not using a mandolin and you just want to cut it in general, I know at the farmer's mm -hmm. market this weekend, they had them that were, oops, uh, did I lose? Oh, nope, like 12 by 12. They were enormous oh, and they were in the yellow, purple, green. Um, but that, that whole thing in the middle, and I, I don't know, um, I usually just cut the bottom and then really, you know, spastically kind of <laughs> chop away at the core. Is there a, a more uh, refined way to go about it? So I think, um, I think it was Catherine that showed us hers, right? That like open face, like if you can get through the half, which sometimes if it's a large one is a challenge, but if you imagine you're cutting through the cauliflower, you open it up, you've got the florets, you know, imagine my body's the core and you've got the florets sticking out. You want to make a cut here. So you want to like, again, you want to triangle that core out. So if okay. it's on the, you've got it flat, we're going to do a triangle cut around the core so that the florets can fall away. And okay. you can go in with probably a smaller paring knife and trim them up and separate them, cut them into smaller pieces. But it's down the half, get it on your board, and then you're going to do a triangle at the core so that the florets okay. fall off. I think some people just snap them off, but then they're really irregular and you have to go back in and trim them yeah. all over again. Yeah, so I find that that technique, yeah, like when you opened up your cauliflower, if you just like imagine on a small one, you're just cutting out the core mm -hmm. and then the it's fall and then you can adjust them as you need. But that's probably your best bet in terms of Thank technique. You. You're welcome. Um, okay, so Lori, I think we're good on time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and you can continue um, talking. Oh, I have.